the unit four is ionic and metallic bonding. So a bond is a force that holds atoms together. In general, we want to follow the octet rule, oct meaning eight, so all atoms want to be like the noble gases because they have eight valence electrons or a full outer shell. Now one exception that you have to know at this level is hydrogen. Hydrogen only needs two electrons to be like helium, the first noble gas. There are three types of bonds, three ways to achieve the full outer shell. Um, the first way is a metallic bond. Metallic bonds are just for metals and they're going to take their valence electrons and make them into a sea of electrons. So those electrons can move throughout the entire bond. Doesn't it's not they're not located at one particular atom. They're free to roam where they want. An ionic bond is between ions. So it's between a cation and an anion. Now cations are positive. You can remember that by that little plus sign there for the T. And anions are negative. Well, metals are the ones that form our cations, and nonmetals form our anions. So an ionic bond is really between a metal and a nonmetal. Now they're going to take their valence electrons and they're going to transfer them. So the cation gives away the valence electrons to the anion. A covalent bond um, is a bond between nonmetals and the valence electrons are shared. So you have metallic, which is just metal, and the valence electrons form a sea of electrons. Ionic, which is between metal and nonmetal, or cation and anion, their valence electrons are transferred, and nonmetal, or I'm sorry, covalent bonding is between nonmetals, and they share electrons. A little bit more about metallic bonds. So it has to be the same metal. So all of these um, atoms are the same element, the same metal. And their valence electrons are free to roam wherever they want within that area, and that's a sea of electron. Another way of saying that is delocalized. So delocalized, D de not local, so they're not found in a specific spot, but anywhere in that area. You could also say then that they are mobile electrons. They're free to move wherever they want within that area of atoms. Because they have a sea of electrons, metallics or metals have luster or that they're shiny. Because they have a sea of electrons, metals are malleable. We're able to put them into different shapes. Because they have a sea of electrons, met metals are also ductile. Because they have a sea of electrons, metals will also conduct heat and electricity. Because they have a sea of electrons, metals also have high melting points and boiling points. So it's important to remember that metals have these properties. because they have a sea of electron or you could say because they have delocalized electrons or because they have mobile electrons. Now ionic bonds are um, between metals and nonmetals and we typically talk about them in terms of their formula unit. So the formula unit shows how many electrons are being lost or gained. One way of doing that is to use a Lewis dot structure. So if we look at strontium, strontium is in group 2, so it has two valence electrons. Oxygen in group 16 has six valence electrons. Strontium being the metal will give oxygen the nonmetal its valence electrons. They're being transferred to oxygen. So strontium has lost all of its valence electrons, and oxygen now has eight. So the formula unit would be SRO. 
If we look at another example, sodium and sulfur, sodium is in group 1, so it has one valence electron. Sulfur is in group 16, so it has six valence electrons, just like oxygen. Sodium will lose its one electron to sulfur. Sodium is happy, but sulfur only has seven. So I actually need another sodium atom in order to complete sulfur's octet. So the formula for this would actually be Na2S. I need two sulfurs for, I'm sorry, two sodiums for every one sulfur. For the last example, let's change this to um, beryllium and nitrogen. So beryllium is in group 2, so it has two valence electrons. Nitrogen is in group 15, and it has five valence electrons. Well, beryllium is going to give away its valence electrons to nitrogen, and my beryllium is happy, but my nitrogen is not, so I need another beryllium. Now my nitrogen is happy, but my second beryllium atom is not, so I need another nitrogen. Now my beryllium atom is happy, but now my second nitrogen is not, so I need another beryllium. So you can keep adding whichever atom you need in order to achieve a perfect octet, and they always work out. So my formula then would actually be Be3 N2. Now another neat way of doing this is just by using the charges. So if we look at beryllium, beryllium is in group 2 so it has a plus 2 charge. Nitrogen is in group 15 so it has a minus 3 charge. If I was to take the number and cross them down, take the number, cross it down, it would be B3N2. The positive and negative goes away. Sodium is in group 1 so it has a charge of plus 1. Sulfur is in group 16, so it has a charge of minus 2. Again, take the number, cross it down. Take the number, cross it down. Na2S1. You don't have to write a 1. Over here we have strontium and oxygen. Strontium is plus 2, oxygen is minus 2. So if I take the numbers and cross them down, I would actually have Sr2O2. But the 2's can be reduced. So that's why it's just SRO. Anytime you can reduce, you need to reduce. So crossing charges. You take the number, cross it down. Take the number, cross it down. So magnesium and phosphorus would form Mg P Mg3P2. Take the number, cross it down. Take the number, cross it down. Hydrogen and oxygen would form H2O. Take the number, cross it down. Take the number, cross it down. Calcium and chlorine would be Ca, CaCl2. Take the number, cross it down. Take the number, cross it down. And then notice that it's both threes, so we can actually reduce that, and it would be just ALN. The properties of ionic compounds are that they are typically hard, but brittle. So we can break them apart easily, even though they are hard. They're also rigid, which means they have a specific structure, a specific pattern to it. They have a high melting and boiling point. Um, they dissolve in water. And dissolve just means they break apart into their ions. So sodium chloride would break into sodium plus 1 and Cl minus 1. And they also conduct, but the only times that they conduct is when they are melted, so in the liquid state, or when they are dissolved, so when they're in water. So why do ionic compounds have these properties? They have these properties because they transfer electrons. So it's all about what the valence electrons are doing in order to rationalize the properties.